And we had the pleasure of talking with Chelsea in March of this year, so only eight months ago, about her wonderful book, Coed Revolution. And this time we are kind of extending the conversation a little bit wider, but I think there are still some parallels in how we talk about gender roles and sexism, misogyny, and how we represent stories of women in history, which is very relevant for the present and the future. So thank you so much for joining, Chelsea. Thank you so much for having me again, Joy. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you again. Um, I was working out in my mind, how do we start this conversation? Because it is such a big, big issue. Yes. Um, maybe start by how you approach this topic with your own students at university. Could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I approach this topic when I teach about Japanese history in general. And my course about Japanese history um, is a little bit of a, a course about history for people who um, don't necessarily like school history, learning history in school. A lot of my students say that learning history in school was about memorizing facts or names. Um, and I try to think a lot more about case studies and global trends. So kind of uh, trees, forest, trees, forest. And so I try to give them the tools um, to think about the world they live in now, which is why I think of it as kind of a history of now. Um, but by thinking through a longer history, they can see um, kind of what typically historians are obsessed with talking about how things we think are new or old, things we think are old or new, um, things like that. And so I always start with just actually talking about the form of the nation state and the origin of national history, not just in Japan, but all over the world. And I think that helps them understand that uh, the way we study history is also very much wedded to our understanding of national identity. And so it's already kind of a politically mobilized subject um, in maybe a more overt way than, than uh, uh, mathematics or physics, which we could say is also political, I guess. But uh, it's already has this political goal often of creating good members of a nation state, right? And, and creating this national identity. So within the context of that class, I like to teach about um, specific thematic issues like migration, um, like war memory, uh, like the US-Japan relationship, um, and uh, also uh, the environment versus the economy. Um, and so when I teach about these thematic topics, I also introduce case studies. And so when I talk about war memory, I use the case study of conscripted labor, colonial labor, and I also use the case of the comfort women. And I try to talk about this thematically and emphasize that this is not just a Japan uh, former colony story. It's certainly not just a Japan South Korea story. It's not just a Japan former colony story. This also has a lot to do with the way that um, colonial histories, wartime histories, um, post-colonialism, uh, also the effect of the Cold War and the US kind of freezing um, the history of the colonial period uh, in post-war Japan. Um, I try to bring these case studies uh, and talk about um, what we can know happened, how we know it happened, uh, how we think of sources, how testimony became recognized as a legal source in the post-war period, and how that's an important source to know what happened. Um, so I talk about all of these things, uh, and we read the Kono statement together, which is very unequivocal and very clear about U.S. Uh, sorry, Japanese military involvement and coercion, but also within the larger theme of uh, gender-based violence during wartime, of coercion under empire, um, and also how this working through of war memory is kind of a post-colonial legacy that we see bits and pieces of uh, in other places. And this year, I do not have any students from 
uh, that are that are not Japanese, but I have many Japanese students raised elsewhere, like in the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and it's very interesting to hear uh, what they've learned, where they've grown up. But in the past, I've also had uh, I had a student who was raised in Japan, but um, who uh, whose parents were from Sri Lanka, and he could connect a lot of the specific issues we were talking about thematically to issues with. Uh, colonial, post-colonial Sri Lanka. So um, uh, what I, yeah, what I try to do is root the history with these case studies and then link it thematically to these larger themes. And actually like, last year in some of my students' reflection papers, a couple of my students um, uh, also wanted to link the comfort woman issue with Me Too. And that was independent of what we learned in class, uh, but they went to the Women's Active Museum um, uh, in at Waseda, and they looked at all these sources, and they thought a lot about women's testimony and sexual violence, and that um, made them think about it in the context of Me Too. Uh, and so that was a very interesting connection uh, I saw as well. And, and so, yeah, I'm trying to emphasize how do we think about what happened in the past, um, and how can we know what happened in the past, and then how do we link it to think about themes and larger issues, especially that we face in the present. Definitely. I, I love that you're, you're helping them open their eyes to what is in their world right now around them and what is in their future. And yeah. so talking about the relevance of history in yeah. terms of, of their reality. And uh, once they see it, they can't unsee it. They'll see it in mass media. They'll see mm -hmm. it in how products are advertised and marketed to them. And yeah. uh, this is really important education yeah. that really should be at all, all realms of education sphere from the very young to all the way through graduate school, right? Well, I think what's really was so eye-opening to me when I went to university is that you um, mostly learn from textbooks and kind of pre-packaged what you should know stuff. And then you get to the university level, or there was a little hints of this in high school, and you kind of learn how you know what you know or how people know what they know. And that was always so interesting to me. Um, when I, uh, and I had friends who were like chemistry majors and, you know, they would say like, wow, my professor talked about chemical intuition, right? Like that there are certain chemicals we just actually don't really know how they're going to react in certain situations. Um, and you kind of understand that there are limits to human knowledge and how can we be sure about certain things? And I try to give them a sense of that. Um, absolutely. And yeah, I try to give them a sense of how they can work through um, what they hear in the world around them, right? So when they hear about uh, Japan and South Korea having issues, I think they often don't really understand what, what that's about. Um, they come in with certain ideas about Japan has already paid enough money or Japan has already said sorry or, um, or things like that. And it's not that I'm not out there to tell them what diplomatically Japan and, and South Korea should do. Um, but all I want to do is present them with how this, uh, how these two countries came to this part point where this is a diplomatic issue and the issues of solving it diplomatically as well, you know, on a kind of elite diplomacy level and how that misses some of the history um, as well. Uh, because part of the problems with hearing about wartime sexual violence, not just in South Korea, not just in Asia, but also in Europe and other places, is a uh, misogyny and that it's very hard for women to speak about these things unless there are certain social structures in place. And still, uh, it's very hard for, uh, you know, elite levels of diplomats or politicians to always be able to focus on uh, still addressing what the victims are asking for. Uh, and so, um, you know, some of my students still emerge from the class and they, and they will, um, say that they do think that, uh, Japan has already paid enough and apologized, but I think they have a also, you know, and that's, that's, um, 
their opinion, but they have a deeper understanding of the issues at stake, uh, a deeper understanding of how that history came about. Um, and so I'm not really there to tell them uh, how these states should move forward, but also in the Kono statement, also one of the huge demands of the survivors of the comfort women system, and actually one of the big demands of survivors in all kinds of of all kinds of historical atrocities, has been not necessarily some lump sum payment, but really that people will remember the story and people will be educated about the story, um, and I think that that's really what I try to emphasize. Yeah, it's so important to just get it right and to to be as clear as possible. And I think that takes us to kind of the reason you and, and the collaborators, the academics from around the world wrote this letter in response, which we're gonna start talking about. But I'd like to start with one of the survivors who's called Grandma Lee. And she was quoted in this excellent New Yorker article about the issue saying that she was really happy that this whole uh, media frenzy about this article came up because it brought back discussion about the comfort women issue, mm -hmm. which wasn't really in the news so much. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a silver lining of this huge uproar, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a very um, important moment in uh the sort of how we're going to memorialize not just the comfort women issue, but World War II. Um, uh, and so we see kinds of similar things happening uh, in other places that are still working through World War II memory. But the last survivors are quite old and they will be, they will pass eventually. And at that moment, um, the history becomes just history rather than uh, sort of lived experience that people can talk about. And I think that this is a, a particularly important moment to uh, discuss these issues with people alive now, with younger generations, um, uh, to be very clear about what are the, the stakes, how do we say we know what we know about things, um, yeah, to be very clear about it. And I think that even though this has sucked up so much more of my time than I thought it would, and this is not, I'm not a specialist and I teach about this history. I am not a specialist in this history. I'm concerned uh, about this history, um, but this has taken up so much of my time. And so sometimes I wonder um, uh, why I <laughs> did this. But on the other hand, I, uh, and it's been so frustrating, it's had its frustrating moments. But I do agree that um, with Grandma Lee, that this has been um, a blessing in disguise because it has gotten uh, the issue of the comfort women in the news. And it, and it does continue the discussion of how um, Japan is, is a former imperial power in post-colonial Asia and there is still that history to unpack. Um, and that's not unique to Japan, that this nation has a difficult history it has to unpack. It's a really shared um, fact. I mean, nation states are built by monopolizing violence. And that's not just literal violence, very literal violence, but also kind of the kind of violence of uh, of a culture, right? Imposing a certain culture and certain standards and, and things like that. So that's not unique to Japan uh, by any means. Um, but I think that that conversation, uh, because it's inconvenient in Japan, it often gets pushed under the rug because a lot of um, people in America, I mean, I'm from the United States, so I think of it in an America sense, but the term the West is kind of vague I suppose, but for a lot of people in uh, the United States or uh, Australia or Europe or, or the Anglophone world, Asia feels very far away. And so I think it is also important for people to remember that there is a imperialist, colonialist history there too that does also need to be addressed. 
And I think one of the, the relevant issues for, for now is that it is, even though there was the Kono statement, it hasn't been officially denied, but it's kind of been walked back. Yes. And uh, textbooks, there's been pressure to change the story in textbooks. Um, but the reason it became part of the news cycle this year was there was a respected Harvard professor who published something in a respected journal and you and many academics uh, were reading through. And it's, it's not an argument against the idea of mm -hmm. having a counter argument. It's the argument of misrepresentation of facts and academic integrity more than anything. Is that right? Yeah, so, so this professor is a, a professor at Harvard Law School and some other law, he's in the, a very narrow field called law and economics, which is a subfield of both law and economics. And the journal he published in um, is not a top journal in his field um, either. And the article he published is about eight pages long. Um, and uh, nobody would have noticed it except for the Sanke Shimbun. Um, so a right wing newspaper in Japan um, published an article about this academic article as cutting edge research, which is frankly baffling to me because this is not a prominent academic journal. Um, and it's not like newspapers are always publishing articles about academic articles, sadly, right? I say as an academic. So it was already being set up uh, by right-wing mass media in Japan as a uh, cutting edge research that proves, they said, that comfort women were simply contractually obligated sex workers. Now, a couple of things about this were already very suspicious. And this also prompted a huge outcry in the South Korean media. Um, but many things about this were already very suspicious. Uh, number one, there's a, a huge um, literature about the comfort women issue in Japanese, in Korean, in English. Um, none of that literature was referenced in this article and an eight page article cannot uh, overturn such uh, rich literature on its own. Um, and also it's not, it's not a really, to use a rational choice argument is also not uh, a historical argument as well. So already this was problematic. Um, and then uh, myself and some other scholars, we began to look closer at the actual sources in the article. And we did the work that I feel like the peer reviewers should have done. I don't know how this article went through peer review and the, the journal has issued um, a statement of concern, but they have not actually retracted the article and they have not been open or transparent at all about their peer review process. So we went through the sources and did what the peer reviewers should have done. And we found egregious uh, errors in the sources. And these range from uh, citation to uh, an anonymous blog, which is not an academic source. Um, and then also to uh, really warping um, the stories that were in the uh, so the cited documents. Um, there was some reference to Japanese government documents, um, but a lot of the sources were uh, uh, documents that were not so difficult to check or not so difficult to uh, read. Um, even one of the key sources that was used has been translated into English as Sandakan Brothel Number 8. So if you are curious for yourself, if you're an English language speaker and reader, you could read the article and also read Sandakan Brothel Number 8 and see how egregiously the story of um, this woman, 
whose name is Osaki, who was not a comfort woman, um, but who was a, a sent to the colonies to work as a prostitute. You can see how egregiously her story is warped. In the article, it's suggested that she entered a contract to become an overseas sex worker at her own uh, will and that she knew what that work entailed, um, even though she was quite young at the time, basically a child. Um, and if you read her book, and it's also important to mention that this is the work that is cited in the article. So it's not like um, there are two conflicting testimonies and the article citing one. This is her testimony, as was related to Yamazaki uh, Tomoko in the 1970s, 60s, 70s. Um, and she says she didn't know what the work entailed. The agreement was with her older brother. And she, when she went abroad first, she worked as a maid until she was basically hit puberty because she was young when she went and then she was raped. You know, that was how she discovered what kind of work she was going to be doing. Um, so that I find not just a, um, uh, an example of academic misconduct, but incredibly disrespectful. Um, and then another, the other specific woman mentioned in the, in the article is Mun Okju, who, uh, and the mention of her story is the citation from an anonymous blog, which is an English translation of an excerpt from her, um, from her memoir, which is published in uh, Korean and Japanese and is being translated into English, fortunately. Um, and it's an excerpt that says that she was able to um, make enough money in tips to buy a diamond. And that was used as proof that uh, comfort women um, were engaged in a very lucrative um, business. Um, there are several problems with that. Namely, her money to buy a diamond came from tips. So that had nothing to do with her base salary. And also, if you read Moon, Moon Okuji's story, if you don't, Moon Okju's story, if you don't just excerpt, cherry pick evidence, if you read her full story, you see that she was trafficked across the Japanese empire twice. Um, and that uh, she was definitely subjected to coercion um, by Japanese military authorities, uh, that she did not agree to do sex work. Um, so it's it's just an egregious twisting of her story, really cherry picking. And just basically, uh, once we went through all these sources, and these are the most egregious um, uh, instances, but if you go through the sources, I mean, there are just page numbers, citations that lead you nowhere, citations that lead you to a page that doesn't tell you what it says it tells you, but instead tells you about uh, a medical doctor who treated comfort women, who believed these women really didn't know what they were going to do and were really naive about sex and an accidental pregnancy. And it's horrific, you know? So, um, uh, so uh, on the basis of that, we put together, I think a, a document that ran to eventually 33 pages, going through every single source in the article and for an eight page document to have a 33 to produce 33 pages a 33 page fact check about misuse of sources <clears throat> i mean we believe that the uh the argument cannot stand i mean it is not based on uh responsible use of sources and the argument cannot stand and based on that we did ask for retraction and asking for retraction is a pretty uh, extreme demand. I mean, it's rather common in the sciences that there's retraction because people can um, uh, replicate an experiment and find it doesn't work or something like that. Um, but uh, still, there's been no uh, uh, confirmation from the journal that they have reviewed their peer review process, that they are responding to our uh, concerns um, and so that's been very, very frustrating. And then subsequent to publishing this, um, we got uh, a lot of harassment online, mainly on Twitter. Um, and that's been ongoing. 
um, for some of us more than than others, um, I kind of get like periodical mini cycles of harassment. Um, but it's been more sustained for some of our other authors. Uh, and it's been just deeply, uh, deeply frustrating. Wow. Uh, let's from the article that you wrote, it's more of a letter collectively ask, asking for the retraction. Um, so that it says there are two factual claims that are fundamental to this argument. One is that uh, the comfort women were contractual agreements between women and brothel keepers that paid women large cash advances. The other is that the women in brothels could leave early if they earned out by paying off their loans and debts. Neither is supported by the evidence Ramsayer uses. In fact, in some cases, the evidence he cites directly contradicts these claims. Uh, so is, is that accurate that these are the main two points of the yeah. call for retraction? Um, well, these are the main two claims that the article makes based on a rational choice theory, based on a, um, a rational choice argument. Uh, that this was the best of all bad options for women. Women entered this um, because it paid rather well and they knew what kind of work there was. There was no coercion and they could also uh, cash out. And there's just no evidence for this. And also, I think beyond that, what this article really ignores is a larger coercive framework um, which involves both misogyny, but also uh, racism, also uh, colonial power. Um, uh, historians have pointed out uh, that the term comfort woman, Ianfu, uh, was also sufficiently vague. It was a euphemistic term, but it was also sufficiently vague that many young women recruited to be comfort women knew they would be comfort women, but they did not know that was sex work, right? That they thought that they would be like doing bandages or working in a canteen or something like that. Um, and I want to be very clear here that there were many women recruited to work in comfort stations and they come from many different places. They come from all over the Japanese empire. And that means that there are many diverse stories and there's evidence that some women knew they would be doing sex work, right? And that they had formerly worked as sex workers and they knew they'd be doing sex work. And many other women didn't know. But I think it's also important at this moment to note one of the uh, major disagreements is were comfort women slaves or not? This term of where were they enslaved or not? And I think Often when we use the term slave, we think of chattel slavery, we think of people who for their whole life are bought and sold, which was a very extreme um, form of slavery and was a very devastating, um, a horrific and exploitative form of slavery uh, with a historical um, uh, precedent, right? Um, with the Atlantic slave trade of people from Africa. Um, but uh, in the United Nations definition of modern slavery, it's simply um, forcing someone to do work that they cannot quit, right? So in that sense, uh, even if a woman were recruited to do sex work at a comfort station um, and she went knowing it was sex work, if she could not quit and leave, then she was uh, enslaved, right? Um, if she could not, uh, even if she was paid, if she could not quit and leave, then that was a form of slavery. And this is part of um, a recognition that not being able to leave uh, a contract uh, is coercion. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes there are pictures of comfort women smiling in these like happy moments and these were used to show that these women were not miserable all the time. But I don't think that that accurately reflects their more general conditions. There were even some comfort women who maybe who serviced officers who may have had a better situation. That doesn't mean that they weren't coerced, that they weren't enslaved. And that also, again, ignores the whole coercive structure of the empire. Um, and I mean, I think that we can also say that 
conscripts were not necessarily um, really free also. So reducing this all to rational choice theory basically sanitizes the violence of colonialism and militarism and imperialism in this historical period. Yeah, and it connects to a lot of the issues we're dealing with in modern times about domestic violence. And if a husband or partner takes away all individual freedom and control, whether they physically abuse them or not, that's a part of domestic violence. Uh, for the Me Too movement, a lot of issues with people being able to report rape in Japan and having to reenact the rape and the mm -hmm. mental and emotional harm that that does. These, you know, are historical understanding of the power dynamic is, is mm -hmm. so key to understanding yes. human rights and justice in our modern times. And hopefully we can own it and move on to a better future for future generations, right? Yeah, and this is where I, I really find this idea that if I teach my Japanese students about the comfort women, they will feel self-hatred or self-loathing. Um, and actually, I have guided some students through this who initially say, you know, they don't like thinking about this because it... Um, makes them you know angry about japan or japanese but i also had a student who was uh half burmese um and she said that at the end of the course she learned to um stop hating all japanese people <laughs> because because she realized that that you know um when we talk about japan being an agent you know a country doesn't have agency there are people within a country um, people in positions of power um, who make things happen. And if we talk about Japan did this, and now we're going to think Japan is bad, it's very important for us to think about with great specificity who did what, and then we can think about how do we uh, understand that in the historical context. I don't love the phrase, we learn history so we don't repeat it, because I think humans just make new mistakes. We just like make new mistakes. Um, but I do think that understanding the texture of that history helps us think about, wait, yeah, where are these kinds of power dynamics, as you mentioned, at play in our society today? And how can what we knew, know happened before be applicable to that situation as well? I mean. There is a reason that groups that have worked for comfort women justice have also done outreach and advocacy for the victims of militarized sexual violence, gender based violence in many other places. There's a reason that the comfort women issue has become a precedent for a lot of uh, United Nations uh, rulings and understandings about gender based violence, sexual violence in militarized zones elsewhere right because these ideas again can travel and again i always want to kind of emphasize the thematic and also maintain the the uniqueness and the particularity and and contextualize it within a place time and then also be able to think about the larger themes yeah absolutely um one thing that we talked about uh when we had the the excellent interview everybody should go and watch from co-ed revolution eight months ago, uh, was talking about roles and defined roles. And even within the student protest movement in Japan, uh, there was often very strict roles uh, in their little private society in inside the protests for who would make food, who would clean, who would uh, make the speeches more masculine roles, who would uh, make the barricades more masculine roles, but the cleaning and cooking were more feminine roles and very clearly defined. But in other ways, um, part of the movement, they all had the same haircuts and the same uniforms to take gender out of the equation. Mm. So understanding how we force gender roles on people, even in modern times, looking back at 
how things were in history uh, when you talk about it in your book, Coed Revolution, but also when you're talking about it with comfort women and how their roles were defined just because they were women mm -hmm. that being forced to work in comfort stations. Mm -hmm. um, and this still has relevancy now in how we talk about mm -hmm. gender roles. Right? Absolutely. And I think that's something <clears throat> that, uh, that's important to talk about also that I talk about with my students that the, is that there are many assumptions, not just about the role of women, but also about male sexuality. Um, and uh, something that that's very uh, troubling is that when the comfort women issue was first coming out, there was a hotline um, that also uh, fielded calls from uh, former uh, soldiers, so men um, uh, who had gone to comfort women stations. And, you know, they had all kinds of different stories too. And I think that understanding um, historical misogyny, understanding misogyny in the world today also invites us to think about um, how masculinity is formulated and how that can also victimize uh, men. And so, uh, you know, it's very, it's kind of heartbreaking when you think about these young boys like learning that this was kind of, you know, that in a sense they were told they needed sexual release. And, um, you know, they were just in a, in a tough situation. I All I can say is that reading through um, the sources that were cited in the article, um, uh, there's uh, one book that's a lot, was written by a journalist in the 1970s in Japan and it's a lot of testimonies, not just from former comfort women. So people knew that this had happened. It just wasn't seen as a human rights violation yet. Um, uh, but also with doctors, medical doctors who treated comfort women. Um, uh, I mean, it just was, it was a bad, bad situation. And I think this is one of the things that this is a little bit of a personal story. Um, but my my brother was in the military, in the U.S. military for 10 years and um, nearly died in Iraq. And it's uh, it's, you know, very, very, uh, I think, important to convey that when a country decides, when a country's leaders decide that they're going to go to war, um, that they're going to, of course, you know, wreak havoc on people in the place where people that live there, you know, I'm not going to say that my family suffered more than Iraqi families um, because the wages paid by Iraqi families was enormous, um, by the Iraqi people was enormous, but also you're deciding that you're going to send your young people out there to kill and be killed. Uh, and that is it takes a huge social toll as well. Um, and so of course now we have a, a, both men and women can be in the military, but particularly during World War II, um, understanding the role of masculinity uh, in, in that war and masculinity among um, these fighting men, these conscript armies, many of them who were so young um, I think that's another important part of the story that when we look at it from the perspective of gender and gender roles, uh, yeah, we can also begin to have a, a tremendous amount of empathy for um, for everybody involved in that terrible situation. I can't imagine it. In reading the sources, I just, sometimes I had to put aside the book and and cry a little bit, honestly. I have incredible respect for the many scholars who have worked on this history in depth. It's, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that whole argument, you touched on this a little bit about when your students, they might feel rejection of uncomfortable history and uncomfortable truths um, as they feel guilty that it might reflect on them. Mm -hmm. And I think you touched on this in your interview with Japan by River Cruise, 
is that they're not, even if they were soldiers, even if, you know, they're not the ones who have ultimate responsibility for what they were forced to do. And talking about men being forced to take on this role of masculinity as mm -hmm. well. So it's, it's not just an issue only about what happened to the women. It's a much wider net, right? Yeah. Now. Absolutely. And I'm reading right now, I'm trying to write something about um, uh, the difficulty of this uh, demand to stay home during COVID for uh, victims of domestic violence. Um, and also how that also relates to, um, you know, female homelessness and, and just kind of the complicated people for whom home is quite complicated and what what stay at home uh might have meant to them uh with covid in, in japan and so i'm reading a lot about um domestic violence at the moment and i've written a bit about it um before but uh yeah i mean if uh the best preventative measures seem to be if you could get to a a perpetrator's uh, um, get to them emotionally and have them work through um, uh, ideas about why they might think that they that a woman belongs to them, uh, why they might think that that's what love is, that control is love. Um, that's actually the best defense against intimate violence. Um, not that all victims of intimate violence are women, but overwhelmingly that's the case. Um, but, and that tells us a little bit actually about uh, male socialization, right? Um, because once you're already advising somebody who has experienced um, uh, intimate violence, that's already become a dangerous situation. Yeah. I think um, getting it back to how we represent history and representing history in an accurate way based on real research and accurate sources, that's the crux of this whole issue. That's why yeah. it came up this year. It was misrepresented and academic integrity did not uh, was not upheld in one of the most esteemed respected journals. So, well, it's not. It's well, not, it's well, not well that's, that's I'm, how I'm, the argument of the right was, right? right because right. it was in a respected journal, it must be true, right? Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that our, our experience of living through COVID is also quite interesting. Um, uh, my husband just shared with me an article about um, uh, fact-checking um, scientific uh, articles, particularly a lot of people now are trying to, you know, there's a deep distrust of authority and people are trying to figure out their own solutions. And so ivermectin, right, has become seen as some kind of silver bullet for COVID prevention and cure. And there are some poorly peer reviewed, poorly sourced medical journals that have recommended that. And then putting the genie back in the bottle with retraction can be a very hard process. I mean, academic work is slow. Citations, making sure your everything is cited is slow. Um, and then double checking every citation is also slow. And a lot of peer review, I suppose, goes on the honor system, like just assuming that this person is an expert and is adequately sourcing. And I think that this particular piece about comfort women passed peer review because the readers, who passed it did not understand Asian history. They didn't know history. It's not a history journal, which is which is very important, and certainly not an East Asia history journal, um, because I think that anybody familiar with this history uh, would at least find it problematic that there's not any gesture towards previously existing research, um, and you just can't overturn that with eight pages. It would require a much more sustained argument with many more sources. 
I think um, Jeannie Suk Gerson uh, of in the New Yorker, she did such a wonderful job yeah. with this article, and she went back and forth. Uh, she she cited your uh, letter for the retraction. She brought in so many other resources. She talked to so many academics, and she talked to the writer himself mm -hmm. and called him out on some of the points that she found problematic. Um, mm -hmm. And even then, even after this, a wonderful, well thought out, amazingly researched article in the New Yorker, everybody knew about, still, the journal decided not to retract this article. Yeah. So Jeannie Suk Garrison is, is also a professor and is a colleague. Uh, um, uh, she's also a professor at Harvard Law School and is a colleague and uh, she, uh, her piece is elegant, it's balanced, uh, she speaks with all parties concerned, um, and uh, I think that in many senses this does not change the academic consensus whatsoever. There is an academic consensus um, and uh, also uh, several Japanese historian associations, they had an event back in May or June um, I, about this um, particular article and also um, wrote a letter uh, much more strongly worded <laughs> than our letter. Our letter really is, is, a, is just a concerned um, uh, sort of, we really wanted to keep it you know, just about the use of sources, just about the facts. But the academic, uh, the historians associations in Japan who uh, wrote a letter um, were much clearer about uh, what they saw as historical denialism and as something very dangerous. And they came together and very give a very strong and unified statement against it. So I think that there's still very strong academic consensus about the actual history um, and as you mentioned, the Kono statement has not been rescinded. Um, there has been a lot of uh, work done to try to undermine it and suggest that South Korea pressured uh, Japan into issuing the Kono statement. But uh, the most recent um, time that an official was asked uh, about the Kono statement was during the Abe um, uh at the, toward the very end of the Abe administration uh, and Suga uh, in Abe's cabinet fielded the question and said that uh, the Japanese government still officially recognizes the upholds the Kono statement at this moment. So that's also uh, pretty clear. And if you read the Kono statement, as I do with my students, it clearly states coercion and it also clearly says that part of the mission is to educate about this. And this is something that my students actually get very angry about because they feel failed. They feel like once they read that, they they did were not really educated about the comfort women. And, you know, um, uh, there are moments when my students feel like they their history education was propaganda. And I think that that's also something um, a little careful about. I think we always like to see conspiracies um, when the reality is much more complex and interlocking, and certainly it's an inconvenient history, and that's part of why um, uh, people on the right, the ultranationalist right, have fought so hard to keep it out of textbooks. But I've also discussed with my students, why else do you think teachers don't really talk about this? And I think that educators are not always prepared to talk about violence and then i think sex i think the fact that it involves sex makes um educators and students very uncomfortable and maybe parents also uncomfortable and that contributes to the the silence around it and this is the this is similar for wartime rape and sexual violence in world war ii in in europe as well talking about sex is really hard um even if it's a long time ago or something like that um, yeah. I so think, I think that actually the yeah. academic consensus has been very clear, but there is a certain segment <laughs> of uh, very politicized 
ultranationalist actors who really want to be able to hold on to this article um, because they want to be able to deny this history. And, and that is very similar to a lot of historical denialists um, in many different places in the world today. Yeah, it's one of the most powerful parts of the article and uh, what was brought up so clearly in the New Yorker article was about Osaki-san, mm -hmm. a 10 year old who yeah. the article was written as, as if she had given permission. Yeah. And she brought up this problem um, that he only quoted part of the story. And it, in the same research that he quotes in his article to give uh, argument that she gave, uh, com you know, she gave, uh, what is it? She said it was okay to do this. As a 10 year old, um, mm -hmm. later in the article, she very clearly says, you lied to me. Mm -hmm. This is not what I agreed to in the yeah. very same article that he yes. references, right? Yes. And that is, has been translated into English as Sandakan brothel number eight. It's a really um, beautiful, melancholy, painful read. But if you want a sense, and this is, she's not a comfort, she was not a comfort woman. She was, this was before um, the actual war. Uh, in the Pacific, she was uh, taken to the colonies um, to work as as a prostitute in in a brothel in Burma. Um, I think Burma. Uh, I'm sorry, I might be confusing Moon Okju and and Osaki, but she was taken to the colonies. Um, and so, if you also want a sense of um, kind of the scope of Japanese empire even before the war period. Um, that's a good read for that. And also the writer of that, um, Yamazaki is, was a very interesting post-war feminist. Um, and she sought out these stories because she knew that these stories were out there, but women had not really been empowered to speak about them. And that's another really important part of the story. And this is something that we should always be thinking about whose story have we obscured um, and if you know that, you know, vaguely you might know this happened, but are these people's voices being represented? Um, uh, I had um, a, a member of SWASH, uh, Sexual Workers uh, Sexual Health um, Organization, come speak to my students about uh, sex work. And uh, she brought up the, the phrase, nothing about us without us. And she said, you know, people talk a lot about sex work and they talk a lot about what protection sex workers need and they need this and they need that and they do this and they do that. And she's like, well, I just really wish that they'd talk with us about it. Just let us in the room when they're talking about that. Um, and also, you know, she pointed out that an actual contract for sex work um, we weren't even talking about the comfort woman in this discussion, but she said there's a, a phrase that you sell your body, but it's not that at all. You sell services. It's very much like the service industry, right? <laughs> like you sell your time, you sell, uh, you sell services. Um, and this sell your body thing, um, I mean, I think it goes back to this idea of if you could uh, kind of buy a 10-year-old or get her on an unequal contract to come far away from her family um, to a place where she can't really escape. Uh, uh, and then she you know, sells her body or something like that. So there's a longer uh, history of also how we think about um, uh, sex work. And then I don't think we can take ideas about sex work as a contract that sex workers are urging us to think about today and then pull it back to the colonial period, when you think about the political economic situation of women um, in this period, uh, uh, yeah, you have to be able to think about power dynamics as well. Yeah. And the whole modern problem that we have all over the world with human trafficking mm -hmm. and taking away power from people to get them to be slave labor or in the sex industry, 
it's it's still happening these days. So what is the best way forward? For sustainability, we often talk about, you know, issues which are better for quality of life for people, all people, and the quality of life for the planet, all areas of the planet, no matter where you live, um, and profits in balance, which is so hard to do. Mm -hmm. But the number one best step forward is always honesty. And this is how I see your role as a historian being so important is trying to uphold academic integrity and proper resources when you're talking about what happened in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think in terms of, uh, you know, human trafficking, I think there's also something very important to remember about um, uh, the mobilization of victims also. And that this is why I think it's so important to listen to comfort women survivors for what, what it is that they say they want. Um, many of them have had complaints about what the South Korean government has done as well, you know? Um, I, and um, because I, I do also, and I have also spoken with sex workers who are um, or former sex workers and sex workers who are frustrated with some of the human trafficking laws, for example, in the United States, um, which make it possible for you to traffic yourself, right? So, so um, these are laws made to protect women and then they victimize women and, um, or they're made to protect the vulnerable and then they further victimize the vulnerable. And, and particularly the, the sex workers I've talked to want to um, frame this as uh, uh, quite similar to a lot of other labor issues. And they want to also um, frame this as a way uh, that uh, we're not doing a lot of, um, yeah, speaking about victims without listening to, to victims, right? And that can be, um, where is the line between protection and a kind of paternalism that is often used also, for example, to uh, squash labor unions, right? We know what's best for the workers instead of the workers. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, to be able to listen to the people directly involved, um, uh, listen to what is important um, to them, I think is also uh, incredibly important. Absolutely. And to see see people, not just see a group and classify them. And, and we see this no. in big tech now too, right? Like Google making decisions <laughs> about things which affect everybody or, you know, other big tech companies like Facebook having so much influence in people's lives uh, yeah. without them yeah. really realizing the influence of media. Um, yeah. You know, so many levels of this in our modern society and taking responsibility for things that have happened in the past and being honest about that and trying to make a better future yeah. is so important. But when you try to erase it or disregard things that have happened in the past, how can we move forward from that, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in every nation, again, because national history is linked in people's minds with national identity. And for many people, it's a very personal connection. Um, and it gives them a, a great sense of feeling like they belong to something bigger than themselves. Um, that means that inconvenient histories are often seen as a threat. Um, and the most extreme case of reacting to that threat is denialism. Um, and I, I just think that that's not all that just doesn't reflect also how complicated humans are. Um, and even the best of us do make mistakes. And if the and if we have power, our mistakes will hurt other people. And so, uh, yeah, confronting the history, honestly, I think also means confronting what do we think? How do we think power works? How do we think humans are? Um, uh, you know, is it, is it okay for us to be so deeply invested in our national identity or does it get in the way of, um, things we have to cooperate about? I mean, 
um, things don't stop at our nation's borders. I mean, if you work on sustainability, you know for sure that like, I mean, if I look around my room, how many things were only made within one nation's borders? Um, and so we have to think about uh, our connections uh, across across those borders too. And those power dynamics too, right? Yeah, I love that story. Uh, when you talk with your students, about human rights and about historical issues, but you also say, look at your clothes, look at the products you buy, where do they come from? What happens after you use them? Where do they go? Are they dealt with only in Japan? It's more global network than we realize. So these issues of human rights and, and injustice and the past mm -hmm. uh, historical relevance, it's all playing out in so many yeah. parts of our lives. Yeah. Uh, beyond what we would think would be connected, right? Yeah, and I think that also uh, teaching students in Japan and living in Japan, when you look at the supply chains uh, that exist, when you look at the production chains uh, that exist uh, that feed Japan today, a lot of that is also built on former colonial relationships and dynamics and um, should be question, we should be very curious about the power dynamics in terms of um, labor, but also in terms of resources and resource extraction, uh, in terms of how we might export our most polluting production processes. Um, when we talk about Tokyo being a, a really clean and pleasant city to live in, or coal guy, you know, these uh, major pollution events being in the past, well, these things are still being built, and we know many of these processes are not as clean as we'd like them to be. So where are they being built? <laughs> Who's breathing that air? Right? Whose bodies are breathing that air, and how is that decided? Um, I think that uh, history, um, for me, learning history, teaching history is a lot about empathy, and like empathy for people who literally lived their lives. I mean, I think sometimes we read a textbook and we forget these were real people who woke up every morning and ate breakfast. I mean, maybe they didn't eat breakfast. I don't know, not everybody eats breakfast, but they did their, their human things and they breathed the same air we're breathing and they had their human concerns and they made decisions based on the information at hand. Um, and that can make us understand some of their mistakes a bit more, but, I think that also can help us be more critical of some of the things that we do because it's so easy for us to see them as so misguided. And I mean, that's not to say that that there's not responsibility. There's definitely also responsibility as well. Definitely. It's so easy to look on the past and decide based on current knowledge uh, what was good and bad. And that's that's not that's not possible when you're in the moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about like, how will people, how will future humans judge my consumption levels, right? Or the kind of life that I live today? Um, what will they see uh, that was a really big problem that I did not recognize or want to look at? You know, that's, that is a great deal of humility to to think about the world in that sense. Definitely. And uh, I think coronavirus has brought a lot of the these issues to the front, right? About supply chain, about human rights, about what we value in society. Uh, yeah. Frontline people, uh, people working at the supermarket are actually just as important to our value of quality of life as the doctors and nurses who are healing us, you know, like if we don't have food coming from the fields to the stores and to our homes, we are in big trouble, just like uh, people making top decisions in the government, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the term essential workers, right? You wonder why so many of these essential workers get paid so little, it does make you think, <laughs> absolutely. It does. So hopefully we're able to see people for their value uh, to society and their value as people more because of coronavirus. That could be one silver lining. Hopefully we're coming away from. I hope so.
Thank you so much, Chelsea. That was a wonderful, very difficult discussion, but I think so important and so relevant to talk about the importance of historical integrity and keeping information as clear as possible for our modern lives and our better future lives. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. It's so much fun to talk with you. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you everybody for joining and have a wonderful weekend. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you.